Erickson holographic theory of mind. Ongoing series, part 64. What is life? Schrodinger versus Kaufman. Or Kaufman's attempt to take on Schrodinger. So we'll see the face face love affair, as I call it. The fact that DNA doesn't cut it in this argument, that common sense knowledge is involved and it's missed. In the preview, Schrodinger wins. We've seen how a mathematics of zero time underlies the entire structure of physical explanation. And we've seen that Schrodinger in 1952 himself rejected the adequacy of psi, that is the wave equation, and the probability or collapse notion or framework of QM introduced by Born. It is currently, it is more correct to say the house of all explanation, biological and psychological. So it is no surprise to see a biologist step in to correct Schrodinger, in this case, Stuart Kaufman. Now Stuart is a professor emeritus at University of Pennsylvania. He's even older than I am, but he's got quite an engine. He's written several books, World Beyond Physics, At Home in the Universe, Reinventing the Sacred, The Origins of Order. And in this context, in the context of this famous work of Schrodinger. We have Schrodinger saying, how can the events in space and time, which take place within a spatial boundary of a living organism be accounted for by physics, physics and chemistry? Well, we've met Stuart before in number 47. He's added many more twists to his thought. For Stuart, Schrodinger poses two main questions. Question one, the source of order question. What is the source of order in organisms? That is, why isn't the frog all jumbled, feet upside down, whatever? Question two, we'll call it defiance of entropy question. How do organisms remain ordered in the face of the second law? That is, how do they avoid becoming entropic blocks? For the problem is in the absence of an organizing force, all complex structures succumb to this they are eventually destroyed. This is an inexorable law of physics. This is what bothered Schrodinger. Stuart is going to answer Schrodinger's questions. This is a crunched down version of what to show of, of uh, his 57 minute presentation in Santa Fe, the Santa Fe Institute, which is a prestigious institute, for which he got a standing ovation, I, I understand. I'm sorry if the argument seems a bit stuck together. In my opinion, it is a bit. So the source of order, this was given by Schrodinger himself. It's not periodic crystals. It is self-organizing physical reactions, like the little picture I'm showing to and pointing to there with the nice forming patterns by that chemical reaction. Rather, it's code scripts encoded in aperiodic crystals, said Schrodinger. In other words, some form of information. This is now understood as DNA. And for this, Schrodinger is seen as prescient. The defiance of entropy, well, says Stuart, first we have boundary conditions, that is constraints that set a limit on the states of a system. His intuitive example is a mini golf course. Change the boards, this equals new boundary conditions. So we change the boards there. Or at pool tables, equally setting boundary conditions for the states of the balls. I can change the boards in the mini golf course and change how things work, how things roll around. So the phase space of states of the ball is changed, expanded. So we're going to hit the concept immediately of the phase space. As we saw, the dynamic love of Romeo and Juliet could be described as a set of differential equations where Juliet's love minus y on the y-axis is the inverse of Romeo's love as his grows, hers decreases. And so the state roams around point to point to point, it's eventually it's essentially a vector. Now, so Stuart enzymes 
RNA, DNA encode constraints, boundary conditions. They form systems with constant or constraint closure. Little diagram, their picture. We have a process that runs under constraint A. It produces constraint B, and which process two runs under. Process two, uh, running under constraint B, produces constraint C, and process three runs under constraint C, producing constraint A. So we have closure, a closed system, also a circular system. We'll be talking about that. Now, a random mutation changes a constraint. A new, this implies or brings about a new constraint closed, constraint closed system. This is equivalent, he says, to expanding that phase space. So I would increase the bounds of that uh, love of Romeo and Juliet. Maybe it, right now it can only go to minus four or plus four, or maybe it expands. The boundary conditions could have been different, he says. Therefore, this, this is counterfactuals, which is equivalent to information, he says, relying on the Shannon notion of information, a reduction of uncertainty. Organisms with constraint closure, this implies constraints on energy release into a few degrees of freedom, like a cannon. So the cannon barrel constrains the forces to make the cannonball a little less wild, go a little more straight. It could have been a tuba-like cannon, less constraint than the forces, more degrees of freedom. Therefore, more work, less entropy, and more informed because the energy is released to fewer degrees of freedom. And now, since reproducing, we have an autocatalytic set. So the system stays in equilibrium, produces some entropy, but not a lot compared to completely disordered things. Thus, reduction of entropy, or his answer to the defiance of entropy. Lestou even brings in, in his way, the problem of the mousetrap we discussed in number seven. I didn't note it here or need it for this, but we'll be getting to it. So now we'll go look at some of these points. For Santa Fe, Stuart ended with this concept of the adjacent possible. Elsewhere, he's led with it, the one I'm pointing to. The adjacent possible, as he says, given what is around now, what happens next? In evolution, for example, once there are fish, and I'll show you a little intuitive set of spears, or phase spaces, if you wish, and we have a fish. The emergence of amphibia are in the adjacent possible of the biosphere. So we have amphibia possible. Once amphibia, reptiles are in the adjacent possible. One gets the idea. Once single cells, multi cells are in the adjacent possible. Not just the biosphere, the econosphere, as he calls it, too. Once there are TVs, the creation of the remote is possible antennas, couch potatoes. Once there are gasoline engines, well, one can have tractors, motorcycles, airplanes, helicopters, etc., etc. Now, TVs, engines, we are in, in the realm of common sense and knowledge. The creation of devices, for example, mousetraps, as we talked about in number seven, of components like pencils. Stewart's insight exactly relates. Like the pencil, he notes the many possible uses of a screwdriver. For example, a knife for self-defense, a mini tent pole to hold up a cloth to protect paint, a door wedge, a hammer, using the handle for the hammer, a spear, a coat hanger, a coffee stirrer, and on and on. He says it's not possible to pre-state all possible uses. The uses are always in a definite list. He goes on, there is no ordering. The uses of these things are not transitive. Use A not greater than B or in B greater than use C. A doorstop is not greater than a hammer, a hammer in turn greater than a spear. This makes no sense. Nor are they in a ratio scale. You can't put those into ratios. Nor an interval scale like a thermometer for zero here means nothing. It's a nominal scale. 
No future use is predictable from a current use. Now, I'm not sure how well the scale argument falls into that statement, but it's definitely a true statement. Thus, no algorithm can list all the uses. It's not an algorithmic thing. This led to an important result, he says, the 2012 paper, where he says no entailing laws, that are, there's no laws driving the evolution from being to being, device to device, but, but it is enabled. It's enabled in the biosphere. And to some astonishing conclusions, as he says in a 2021 paper, titled What is Consciousness? Artificial Intelligence, Real Intelligence, Quantum Mind, and Qualia. So he's about to veer into cognition and the problem of consciousness, the hard problem. Artificial General Intelligence, AGI, he says, based on universal Turing machines, is not possible because it's not algorithmic. You cannot create these devices algorithmically, he's saying since universal Turing machines cannot find novel affordances. Now, to note, the use of astonishing implies, in my opinion, never seen before. And for the record, this all was stated by yours truly here in 1976, my PhD thesis with that title, which I know that before was done with Bob Shaw, a direct student of Gibson and the founder of the journal of ecological psychology and we didn't choose to use the term affordances the affordances of a pencil because i mean to me it seemed a stretch but it's not invalid to say it other articles the 2002 paper there um, more specifically let out in 2012 the meditation on a mousetrap and elsewhere now stewart's working in a different sphere the biological sphere me in the cognitive science sphere, and uh, he's very into the cognitive science side, like the physicists I've complained about tend to do without thinking a whole lot or researching the literature that's already extant and the history thereof. On my side, I didn't want to publish in the biological sphere because I didn't think I belonged there, nor was I quite clear that biologists would. Uh, even understand the argument, but that's just an, an aside. To remind us where this is going, to fit in this argument, albeit, in my opinion, a bit awkwardly, again, we're talking about the example of the mini golf course changing the boards, using the boards for a different thing, kind of like using the pencil for a different thing, thus leading to the idea of space, phase spaces, boundary conditions, etc. Stuart thus hits Darwinian pre-adaptation. To quote, the heart's function, he says, is to pump blood, but it also makes heart sounds. But you can imagine an environment where it's selectively advantageous that a heart makes heart sounds. For example, it's a resonant chamber, so it can pick up earthquake pre-tremors. I alone survive an, earth, an LA earthquake, and all my descendants pass this on, a new function in the biosphere. Or swim bladders a ratio of water to air to adjust buoyancy in the water column. So paleontologists think that this arose from lungfish. Some water got in and it was poised to become a swim bladder, a new function, neutral buoyancy in the water column. Could you have said this ahead of time? Or the leg, it, to quote, evolved out of the fins of, of a fish. Like using a screwdriver for a new task, he says. Now, pre-adaptation is just, shall we say, the pre-form of exaptation, which we've seen before. To quote Darwin, on the same principle, if a man were to make a machine for some special purpose, but were to use old wheels, springs, and pulleys, only slightly altered, the whole machine with its, all its parts might be said to be specially contrived for that purpose. Thus, throughout nature, almost every part of each living being has probably served in a slightly modified condition for diverse purposes and has acted in the living machinery of many ancient and distinct specific forms. So the old wheel springs and pulleys only slightly altered. This, the old slightly altered trick. But notice 
in this slightly altered trick, how easily the fin glides into the leg and into its spine, or the lung into a sw swim bladder, the ease of the, tr of the transitions. Stewart has not seen the depth of the problem. Stewart's just in the middle of the problem of common sense knowledge. AI's nemesis, unconquered. He somewhat sees this. He also sits in the middle of Behe's mousetrap. The equivalent problem. Behe, 1996, wrote the book Darwin's Black Fox. Therefore, those transitions are transformations. Let's take Behe first. Behe, we saw in number seven, challenged the possibility of the algorithmic approach to the design and evolution. He placed the problem initially in the intuitive context of a mousetrap. Standard mousetrap. As a functioning whole, he argued the trap is irreducibly complex, irreducible complexity. For the device to work as designed, all the parts must be present and organized correctly, else it does not function. Without the platform, it doesn't work well. Without the uh, staples holding down the spring, it doesn't work well, etc. It has to have all the parts to work. Natural selection buys nothing here. Natural selection picks some feature or component to continue because it happens to have been proven useful for survival in theory. But evolving a single part or component, say of our mousetrap, which by itself has no survival value, is impossible by definition. Impossible, that is, by the definition of the role and function of natural selection. So McDonald, four years later, argued that there could be many simpler forms of mousetraps, all functional. And he produced a series, his first series, a series of six, showing trap one and trap two. Trap two, for example, note the instructions. That the mouse is the place's paw right next to the board there, the platform by the spring, so that the paw gets trapped once he moves that um, the cheese. Behe argued, however, it's not that simpler mouse traps do not exist. The question is progression, the actual mechanism of movement from A to B to C. Consider the, quote, evolutionary steps, unquote, from trap one to trap two. So we bend the arm, that is one bend through 90 degrees, so the end is perpendicular to the axis of the spring and points toward the platform. Then we bend the other arm through the 180 degrees so that the first segment is pointing opposite to, opposite to its original direction. Then we shorten that particular arm so its length is less than the distance from the top of the platform to the floor. <clears throat> Then we introduce the platform of staples. These have an extremely narrow tolerance in their positioning, for the spring arm must be in the precise edge of the platform, else the trap won't function. That's why we have to have instructions for the mouse. Now, remember, this is a metaphor. This could be the transition between two types of beetle. So McDonald, a couple of years later, did an improved series trying to show making a new device by adding just one part at a time. The evolutionists rather desperately need just one part at a time. Why? Because the joint probability of the, the multiple steps becomes improbability, becomes enormous. They have to keep it down to one part at a time. So here's the second series. Here's trap five and trap six of the second series. Same problem. No, the hold down bar just appears from somewhere with anchoring on the platform, precise anchoring. There's a fancy precise release mechanism, not quite shown in the picture that's necessary for when the um, cheese moves, such that the whole trap is released. We need re repositioning on the platform. The hammer has now been forced down, repositioned. All of these steps, must be accomplished before the next trap. Yes, the adjacent possible, trap six, will function. An intermediate but non-functional is useless stage cannot be selected. It has no survival value. This complicated transition is a sequence of steps that must occur coherently, simultaneously. 
Here's the problem. Here's the rub. With each step required, we decrease the probability of random occurrence exponentially. If one change out of 1 in 10 chance, two changes to do both of them has 1 in 100 squared. Three changes to do all three, 1 in 10 to the third. And of course, we're dealing at the micro-micro level. For example, in reality, one mutation at the cell level, like sickle cell anemia, we're starting at like 1 in 10 million as our start number for getting one change, one mutation. So Stewart cannot select the adjacent possible so easily, simply via a random mutation. Moving to the next device, way more complex. Note, again, a random mutation in this, his uh, schema here. That's what he's relying on. His model, simply moving the boards, which is equivalent to moving the screwdriver, or using the screwdriver differently, uh, but in the mousetrap context, it's the complex transformation set needed for the next trap as such. For Stuart, I don't think we need consciousness for the story. Kind of let that sink in for a second. We don't need consciousness. Hence, his boundary conditions, which create form. In other words, he's veered to the purely mechanical. He's trying to stay in the purely mechanical without consciousness. We'll come back to these. The fact is this all requires consciousness. Remember the bendings McDonald required. Bend the arm 90 degrees, so it's perpendicular, etc. We've seen these before. Penrose, his foldings, bendings, stackings of hexagonal structures into little three-sided cubes, stacking them over the previous, invariantly making a cubical number. That is his visual proof of a computation that does not stop the halting problem. Piaget, the rotations of the tunnel, the oscillating order of the beads, an invariance law for children th three to seven. It takes them up to, to age seven to learn this law. The order of the beads, ABC goes in, I, I rotate the tunnel 180 degrees, the order is inversed. If I rotated the tunnel 360 degrees, then the same order that they went in, ABC. If I do that three times, order is inverse. Do it eight times, the order is preserved. Odd even roll. Perception of invariance over this set of transformations. Wertheimer, a five-year-old's folding of a parallelogram into a cylinder and then asking for a scissors so she can cut it to make a rectangle to compute the area. What were these? Well, in Penrose phraseology, non-computational thought requiring consciousness. Why non-computational? Why require consciousness? These are transformations over an indivisible flow of time. Else the globality of the transformation cannot be perceived, nor the invariance over that transformation registered. The zero time, the time of discrete instance, each instant with the duration, so to speak, of a mathematical point, Similarly, equivalently, the instantaneous states of a computer cannot support this. We need consciousness, that is memory over time, that is gluing those instants, binding them together, else there is no consciousness. And we saw that creating a mousetrap from, from available components, as Kaufman and Darwin envisioned, Again, on the acceptation principle, old whales, springs, and pulleys, only slightly altered, is the operation of analogy, the fundamental cognitive operation on which everything rests, even supposedly pristine logic. We saw we could take a pile of components and construct mousetraps that are analogous to things, a crossbow mousetrap, a beheader mousetrap, where the pencil's lodged in the corner of the box. Again, this is a dynamic transformation over an indivisible flow of time over which the features of the objects, for example, of the pencil emerge. 
This is why the possible functions of the pencil are an indefinite list, because all possible transformations on it are indefinite. And it's the assertion of the object into an event invariant structure. Coffee stirring, for example, the invariance allows defining it a radial flow field, velocity vectors, inertial tensor, idiobotic ratio, acoustical invariance. And we can insert a pencil into this structure. It has the requisite rigidity with to move the liquid, et cetera, such that it supports the event structure. But to carry this out, the brain and its operations are intrinsically embedded in an indivisibly transforming field. But concomitantly, the universe itself is happily creating biological devices. The dynamically indivisibly transforming universe itself has, as we've noted, the element, elemental attributes of consciousness, at least, via its holographic property and via its indivisible transformation. Or as we saw from yet another perspective, consciousness as the inextensive drives, pushes, so to speak, the events the uh, field of matter into existence as an extended, extended matter, ultimately moving toward the abstract space underlying mathematical description, geometrical description, but this is an ideal limit, never fully reached, enough for practical purposes in physics, for example. Creation of forms, beings, devices, therefore cannot be algorithmic. Stewart knows this in a sense, but in trying to stay in the Darwinian framework, he appeals to random mutations. Again, looking at our schema, the random mutations, as we saw, boundary conditions, again, and expanding state or phase spaces. That is, he actually stays within the algorithmic. Again, for him, consciousness is not needed. Now, there's other things in this schematic argument I could look at. For example, the boundary conditions could have been different. They're counterfactuals, therefore this is information. Keen on the Shannon uncertainty notion of information. We could definitely parse that one into uh, its difficulties, but We'll avoid that for now. But note, RNA, DNA are boundary conditions for creating new bioforms. Can this work? Let's go right off to the worst case, use cases. If we were building a system, the problem of instinct, as we noted in 46, the caterpillar and the wasp. The wasp knows the nine precise neural motor centers to sting, plus a head squeeze with its mandibles to paralyze the caterpillar, yet keep it alive for its young. How did it learn this? There, again, there could be no evolutionary steps one by one. It has to be all at once. Or for the cricket, the three precise nerve centers for the wasp that stings the cricket. So an ammophila, a type of wasp doing the caterpillar, once learned all nine strokes at once, plus the head uh, twist and transmitted it in its DNA. And how is this represented in DNA? Again, transmitting just one stroke, no, by definition, there's no survival value. So this is just irreducible complexity in another form, staring at us, embodied in instinct. How are these wasps providing for their offspring before this? How were the larvae staying alive before this knowledge? The instinct and the origin of the biostructure, say for the wasp using it, cannot be separated. It is one problem that has to be explained. For example, finding he has an ovipositor, the wasp does not dream up a use for it. And there was this guy, Mr. Spider. 
Here we saw the unreal complexity in spiderweb construction, or bird migration, etc. We scaled it up to a human scale. Two trees, 300 feet apart, 90 feet high. We'd need one mile of rope. Every web is tailored to the environmental configuration. It cannot be a hardwired motored program. Bird migration, same problem. Again, just like the wasp, the question became, how can DNA possibly code such knowledge? Morphic fields, as we explored with Sheldrake in number 43, might explain the memory passed from generation to generation, but not the initial creation. There was spider number one and wasp number one. How this knowledge had to have been there. You must load this complex knowledge on DNA somehow. But this is just common sense knowledge. AI's nemesis encoded as instinct now, under the term instinct, in DNA. And now for Stewart as boundary conditions. Really? Can boundary conditions constrain the form, the structure of the frog, looking at it from another point of view, focused on DNA as playing this role? Our machines work because the forces are purposely and rigidly constrained, channeled, guided, sort of as Stuart noted with the cannon. The computer, extremely rigid constraints on forces. Else forget it, the computer fails miserably. Without such confinement, the forces escape. The machine dies. We go to entropy. And the machine by itself is not constructing creating these constraints. If you do find one, well, you're just in some infinite regress because ultimately you're gonna find somewhere it was designed. The frog, however, is an entirely different story. Mr. Frog is a fluid mass of trillions of cells, all in concert, maintaining this ever-changing but constant form. Yet the forces of the frog do not escape. Note, this constant fluid change that yet preserves a bioform of structure's goal-directed behavior. Instinct, building webs, migrating to somewhere, goal-directed behavior. And why it's one problem. Focus on just one of the frog cells. The quote from Mind, Memory, and Time by Carl Gunther, a book I like. The internal structure of a cell continually changes over time. A fluid construction that is three quarters water. Innumerable tiny currents of molecules stream through its watery interior to where they are needed. Over time, the cell's internal structures are continually rearranged in a big way. The many internal membrane walls are continually broken down and reformed. The metabolic machines of the cell's huge factory lines are built, operate for a period, and then are torn apart and recycled. Everything is part of a great churn. Take one muscle cell. It stacks and stacks of actin myosin filaments, 16 billion thick ones, 64 billion thin myosin, myosin filaments in one one centimeter long cell, like loaves of French bread in organized piles. One can go on and on in the complexity of these fluid structures. This is what astounded Schrodinger. The blob, the max entropy is a precise calculable number in physics. The continuous directed motion of living molecules then is astronomically improbable. The same astronomical improbability as the egg reassembling into its yes, astronomically improbable structure. Stuart would have, us have this all under the control of DNA via its driving information, like a boundary condition, just like rearranging the boards. The intuitive model seems to be of a 3D printer. The computer's instructions guiding the machine to channel the plastic to create the form, the form of the heart there. But where biologically are concrete channeling mechanisms acting directly from the instructions? That is, what's the analogy to the nice nozzle thingy that's sp sprayed under the instructions of the computer to create that form? The DNA sitting in a cell itself is a continuously changing fluid thing. What maintains its form? To the circularity problem, Stuart would likely bring in this constraint closure. That is, constraint A again is using process one, 
Process one under constraint A produces constraint B. Process two uses constraint B, etc., all the way around back to the circle. How this could be accepted as a logical principle, I don't know. Where is the magic that brings, say, constraint A into existence? Else nothing gets going. Well, we won't dwell on this, but I find this is really problematic. But constraint closure with boundary conditions brings in his evocation of expanding phase spaces. Let me change the boundary conditions. And therefore, because we've got new boundary conditions, the creation of new forms, beans, beetles. Again, the, um, again, the phase space, the dynamic love of Romeo and Juliet, where again, Juliet's love, the minus y is decreasing as Romeo's increases. And we could put a bound on this space where Romeo's love can't be uh, greater than five or less than five, as an example. And we saw that we could rewrite this matrix or this um, set equation set in this form. That is, the vectors where each of those points there, my little orange uh, yellow point is a vector, same minus two plus four, a vector, um, minus four, minus minus four, minus four, et cetera. These are vectors. Okay. Uh, now we make the vectors go around via that matrix, a transformation matrix, matrix M. So the rate of change of some vector V is equal to some matrix M times itself, that is times the vector. And we saw that psi was exactly the same form. That is, the um, psi in brackets there is a state of a system as a vector. Momenta, et cetera, all wrapped up into that vector, position momentum. That is, it's a complex high dimensional form of the same thing. That is, it's a high D phase space. And Schrodinger unsuccessfully struggled with the physical meaning of size high dimensionality, as we saw in number 45. He couldn't get there. Later, he disparaged the adequacy of psi, particularly in complex interactions in 1952, to include its probability interpretation as per Born. As a physical explanation, it's extremely questionable the phase space idea and its usage, useful. Yes, a phase space will describe a steam engine speed governor, but it's a description. It's not a real understanding of the forces involved. And all of this occurs in the zero time, the abstract states and instants. In truth, this can DNA do it question is now moot. I've been tasked with writing a comment on a chapter by Stuart A. Newman for a forthcoming book. Here is a start. I direct your attention to the bottom half for a second of the book. It's entitled Self-Organization as a New Paradigm in Evolutionary Biology. And uh, his chapter is Self-Organization and Embryonic Development, Myth and Reality. So here's a start. A series of findings beginning in the 1980s led to the mostly unacknowledged disappearance of the notion of a genetic program. Let me just stop there. Mostly unacknowledged. Sad. Okay, but disappearance of the notion of a genetic program from the theoretical discourse in developmental biology. This idea, inspired by the rise of the digital computer in the 1950s and the associated hardware software distinction, attempted to, to locate the information acquired during phylogeny in each organism's nuclear DNA, where it was deployed in a high, hierarchical fashion during ontogeny. And he proceeds to list half a dozen experimental areas and findings within those areas that have destroyed the concept. So Newman expresses concern over the many biologists now pushing physical self-organization 
as the new answer. Schrodinger, we saw, already noted this possibility and rejected it. Newman describes where it works and where it fails. It has some success, but generally it's insufficient to the task. Kaufman, for example, in Santa Fe, to his credit, saw this noted by Schrodinger and accepted it too. That is this insufficiency. Hence his paper, trying for a different principle. And Schrodinger, to quote, enough is known about the actual material structures of organisms and about their function to state that, and to tell precisely why, present day physics and chemistry could not possibly account for what happens in space and time within a living organism. He expressed personal dislike for a non-physical explanation, but he could only conclude that the molecular order of life is caused by a force that is unacknowledged by conventional science. This has not changed. Well, I couldn't resist the postscript. Curiously, Kaufman and Rowley provide their solution to the hard problem. Intuitively, they know evolution and the hard problem are connected. To quote them, we are not merely syntactic and algorithmic. Mind is almost certainly quantum. And it is a plausible hypothesis that we collapse the wave function and that we perceive affordances as qualia. So essentially they're arguing that they've got a solution to the problem of the origin of the image of the external world. And they're veering to their idea that indeed these things are connected. Yes, note, the, note that article, Unconsciousness Cognition, Evolution and Time is indeed related. But here the quantum collapse is taken as reality. Yet Schrodinger rejected Born's collapse notion as we saw. Further, this is just Hameroff and Penrose, their or core revisited as we've seen. And Kaufman and Rowley seem unaware of this. In reality, they don't even reference Hameroff and Penrose. So this is not an answer to the origin of the image of the external world. Equally then, it's not an answer to the problem of qualia. It's that image is entirely qualia to include its forms, as we've noted. The image with its qualia arising from a quantum collapse, as we've noted, is pure magic. This is a model of, a, of the qualitative image we've seen in matter and memory, a holographic field, the brain forming a reconstructive wave passing through this field specific to a source, the source now becoming the specified image, right where it says it is, external within the field, not within the brain. At the base of their problem is the failure to understand the centrality of the problem of time. All this, this model of Bergson's, is driven by the indivisible transformation of that holographic field. Yep, they really need to study Bergson. In the second full script, because I just saw this, Anil Seth, in this interview. Anil is a uh, consciousness theorist, and to him, the brain hallucinates, it creates your conscious reality. So this specified slide there is in reality just an hallucination generated somehow by the brain. A tasty hallucination if you're the frog. So discussing his new approach to the hard problem, he says, shifting from trying to think on consciousness as a single mystery to thinking of it as a collection of related challenges, the analogy here is what happened with, with the scientific understanding of life. Instead of searching for the spark of life, the Elan Vital, Life was naturalized by isolating and then explaining its different but related properties, things like metabolism, homeostasis, reproduction, and so on. And bit by bit, the hard problem of life was not solved, but dissolved. I think he means solved. I can't imagine Schrodinger's response to this. So Schrodinger's problem this fundamental problem of physics, the inexorable proceeding of the 
law of entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, has been dissolved. Interesting. This is a sad unawareness, a faulty mindset, an intuition, an insight, an intu that is intuition, shall we say, like Bergson's to the right there. And the hard problem is and was not achieved by componentizing, breaking things down into little bits, and then making it go away. Nor has or will Schrodinger's problem of life. So next time we'll see. Till then, signing off.